This land is mine. God gave this land to me. Greetings from Gosh Recording from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. <laughs> Ah, oh, the joys of my life. <laughs> well, before anything, may I say that I am going to ask Sean to post two photographs. One of me in some of Marissa Berenson's fabulous, fabulous jewels. And the other of Marissa and me in front of some of the jewellery that she makes. It's done with mostly real stones, but semi-precious stones. She says it's costume, uh, but it's really fabulously, wonderfully, just imaginative and stylish jewellery. Uh, they're all collector's items and I'm sure that they will end up being something that will be of interest in the future because not only was Marissa a top model and a very famous actress, but she is also Elsa Schiaparelli, the great designer's granddaughter. So she certainly has creativity in her genes. And I had the good fortune of running across her in Tangier. And I'm posting these so that if anybody would like to know about her jewelry, let me know and I will try to track down how you can obtain it. They're all one-of-a-kind pieces. They're all collector's items. So I put it, let me put it that way. It's not junk. It's really gorgeous stuff and just spectacular. So now, Without further ado, I will plunge right in with an update. The bongo bongo drums have been beating and people have been asking me on the QT, how is Catherine? And so I am going to tell you because I have good news for you. My understanding is that Catherine's recovery continues apace. Of course, when you're getting chemotherapy, it knocks you for a six. But putting that aside, she is doing very well. So to those of you who want to know, that's it. Also, <laughs> yeah. I have to commend the person who had the initiative to buy the American, what's it called? American Riviera Orchard dot co dot UK website and <laughs> direct traffic to the home page that states forgiveness, permission, please donate to the Trussell Trust. <laughs> And the message on the Just Giving page reads, Not Megan, hope Megan wouldn't mind, thoughts with Catherine, kisses. <laughs> oh, dear. It also explains the premise of the Trussell Trust, which provides practical support for those who cannot afford essentials, and it also campaigns for a future where nobody will ever require emergency food supplies. A very noble cause. And I'm sure Megan, being so humanitarian and philanthropic, 
won't in the least mind that people are going to be benefiting from her hustle, which incidentally, in, for those of you who aren't aware of it, is going down like a lead a balloon. She's been able to come up with three minor names who, of course, they're presenting as A-listers. Since when well, was Delfina Balkir de Figueras an A-lister name? Well, maybe in Polo, but certainly nowhere else. And Polo accounts for maybe 0.00001% of the interest in the world in sports. Then there's some other woman who I'd never heard of. And there's that actress, Abigail Spencer, hardly up there with the Nicole Kidmans and Elizabeth Taylors of this world, but they're scraping the bottom of the D-list barrel now. <laughs> Poor darlings. I understand that the word in Hollywood is oof. The plague is upon us yet again. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, let me plunge in with what Proactive has to say. Lady C, what do you make of Harry's travelist revelations and Nacho Figueres promoting <laughs> Megan's jam? <laughs> oh dear. Well, we all know that Harry took the money that he was given when he and William went their separate ways in terms of money that they had put into a charitable enterprise in this country. Harry took that money, set up a company called Travelist, <clears throat> sorry, put those charitable funds in the company which is supposed to promote all sorts of ecologically desirable travel. One private plane at a time. Mm. Well, the travelist revelations, of course, I think that proactive is referring to have nothing to do with the extreme opacity of their accounting structure and the wonderful work that they do as they promote one private aeroplane trip for the elite after the other while informing the public now, you really shouldn't go abroad. You need to remember your place. And your place is within 15 minutes of where you live. You shouldn't be getting out of your place. You need to remember your place. And of course it revealed that Harry poor sweet darling Harry, is no longer resident in the United Kingdom. The fact that he is not resident in the United Kingdom raises issues, especially in people's minds, which I think I will address in the next question, because if I remember correctly, this is an issue that comes up in the next question. So let's get to Nacho Figueras promoting Megan's jam. Well, of course, Megan has given jam to Nacho Figueras and his wife Delfina. I think the Telegraph yesterday made a very good point that Megan's close friendships have a very 
back scratching element to them. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Oh. It's pure friendship. Just let's never forget the money because you should never give away the milk free. No, no, no. Not if you can charge for it. <clears throat> so, you have not only Delfina de Figueras promoting the jam, but you have Nacho Figueras promoting the jam. And it's actually quite clever because every single time you mention either of their names, you boost their profile. And since they rarely don't have a profile of any consequence internationally, this is a way of Harry and Meghan and Netflix getting them to become names. Their names in the polo world, but their names are nowhere else. Well, if their names are repeated enough, they become identifiable or more identifiable. So their profile is boosted and they are going to move up the list from is it F to E? Or is it E to D? Well, I don't think, I mean, in Polo, they may be A-listers, but anywhere else, <laughs> forget it. And there is Nacho Figueras promoting the jam and doing a photograph of the jam that he spread strawberry jam, which actually I can't stand. I mean, I don't mind strawberries jam with scones, but by and large, I can't stand it, never could. However, he has it spread on a full piece of toast. Senor Figueras, you presumably were properly brought up and know that you do not spread all of your toast with jam and then eat it. You break the toast in at least in two. And if you need to, you then break it again and you put the jam on that bit of the bread, which allows you to have either one or two bites. Well, I suppose that's the nicety that has gone the way of many of the other niceties. After all, my hand scratches your back and your hand scratches mine. Hmm. Well, I suppose there's no real harm in mutual opportunism because basically it is a relationship that has strong commercial elements. And there's no reason why people who are basically in a commercial enterprise together can't use each other. That's what commercial enterprises are all about. And as long as you don't abuse or misuse them, it's perfectly all right. Where it becomes complicated is when friendship is put into the mix. But I think we all know that Megan, for one, is the living embodiment of somebody to whom the true values of friendship are antithetical. And as for Harry, some of the things he's done to his friends in recent years, mm -mm, very Meganian. J. Frost says, Lady C, in your opinion, does the reported change in Harry's primary residence, now listed as in the USA at Company's House, have a major impact? 
I believe this impacts tax, visa status, councillor of state, etc. It seems an interesting move to make at this point in time. Would love your insight. Thank you. Uh, we have a double taxation with the United States of America. So there is actually no problem. If you are resident here and earning money over there, it is collected no matter what. And vice versa also applies. So to an extent, being an American resident would not necessarily see an increase in the tax he pays. It might even see a decrease in the tax he pays. Because let's not forget that their base of operations commercially is in Delaware, which is the onshore, offshore port of call for people who want to minimize their taxes in the United States. This American state for at least the last two decades has gone out of its way to destroy every single foreign offshore banking delight, really. <laughs> So that Americans would be induced to leave their money in the United States. And that's what's happened with Delaware. A creation of President Biden's before he was the president. So that takes care of the tax element in terms of how much to pay with the double taxation treaty. However, American residents have to pay tax on their worldwide income. So do British tax residents. So you have the situation whereby as long as the double taxation treaty kicks in, everything is okay. Except Uncle Sam makes demands for anybody who is an American tax resident, resident, which is slightly different from tax resident, but still, or citizen. I know banks in offshore centers that will not accept a client who's an American resident or citizen because Uncle Sam can then claim rights of inquisition. So that's one to watch. But I would imagine that the royal family has been a very careful to make sure that any intrusiveness by the American tax authorities would be stopped before it even starts by making arrangements which preclude them from their invasiveness. His visa status, he's a resident. If he's a declared resident, he is already a resident of the United States of America. How does that impact upon his visa status? If he lied to become an American resident, he can be thrown out. But the American ambassador to the court of St. James's has already announced that under the Biden administration, Harry will suffer no adverse consequences whether he broke the law or not. 
his counselor of state that the Regency Act does not speak about residence, it speaks about domicile. They are different. Your domicile of origin is where you were born. And as long as you intend to be buried in the country of your birth, and usually you display that intention by buying a burial plot, then your domicile of origin is maintained. So it doesn't affect the councillor of state matter. So I hope that clears it all up. Well, I have a little bit of news from on high because I'm sure some of you will know that the Telegraph has been saying that Harry has a one around and that Mr. Justice Fancourt in the action against the Sun has blocked the Sun's application to have a part of the case heard before next January or in the alternative and more than likely that the main body of the tr trial which was going to take place next January would be moved further back to allow a particular issue to be resolved. And Mr. Justice Van Court has quite rightly, in my view, said, no, it is an application that is unsound. Everybody has been trundling along for however long, expecting the case to be tried next year, January, and he's not vacating the trial date. This is not a victory, particularly for Harry. This is a defeat for the Sun in terms of all of the, I think it's 42 remaining individuals who are suing news group newspapers, the publishers of the Sun. So, of course, Anything that can be presented as a victory by Harry or for Harry is presented as a victory. Now, it's certainly not a loss for Harry, but is it a victory? Is Harry the only person who is involved? Harry's one of 42. I mean, this is where the media are so irresponsible. And it was an application put in by news group, newspapers. How is it a victory for Harry? It's a loss for the Sun in an application. It's a victory for all of the 42. But I would hardly have called it a victory. Yes, they, they managed to block the sun in hiving it off. But, I mean, the exaggeration is just always so offensive. However, David Sherborne has already indicated that, and I'm going to quote what he told the court. The Duke of Sussex is subject to the same issues that Sienna Miller and Hugh Grant have been subjected to, that offers have to be made that makes it impossible for them to go ahead. I'll tell you what has been going on there. News group newspapers thought if they could hive off that aspect of the case, it would put them in a stronger position to negotiate for settlements. That's what that was all about. 
And Mr. Justice Van Court, quite rightly, saw the ploy for what it was and saw it off. Just as how Hugh Grant was going to be exposed to 10 million in costs, Harry, at this point, will be exposed to exactly what Hugh Grant would have been exposed to. And the clock keeps on ticking. So unless he accepts the part 36 offer, I think is what it's called, uh, and takes the money and runs. And of course, it was never about the money, no. <laughs> no, of course not. It actually was about the money for David Sherborne, the money for the lawyers, generally, and the hope that if they could prevail, that they would be able to introduce a privacy law through the courts. That's really what it was all about. But the money, I'm sure Harry is not going to donate it to anything but the worthy cause of Meghan. Mm. Scots forever say, says, sorry, says, <laughs> sorry. Former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Murrow, has been charged with embezzlement of SNP funds. Please comment. Well, yes, Nicola Sturgeon is the former First Minister of Scotland. Her husband, Peter Murrow, who was involved I think he was the treasurer of the Scottish National Party. And he has been charged with embezzlement of the funds. <laughs> Poor Nicola. And all she wanted was independence for Scotland so that she could make Scotland a part of the European Union again and cause huge trouble for the English. Oh, poor Nicola. Not to mention destroying the basic fabric of Scottish national life, which she would have gladly done just so she could have gone down in history as the first president of Scotland. And he fingers in the tail. Oh, dear. Well, so far it's just a suspicion. And until he is proven guilty, we need to remember that in this country, you are innocent until proven guilty. But my goodness, is the rumour that he has green fingers anything to do with plants? Or is it the dye from the dollar bills? <laughs> Let's see. Anne Moorish says, I read in the mail that Julia Rousing died yesterday. She was one of the biggest philanthropists in the country. You seem to know everyone. Well, I wouldn't have put it quite like that, my dear. <laughs> but I may know of a great many people and I may have come across several of them, but I wouldn't say I know everyone, but it's kind of you to think that I do. Did you know her? So happens I did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and if so, what was she like? Well, I'll tell you what she was like. She was very pretty. She was charming. She was very bright. How do I know her? Her father and stepmother were very old and great friends of mine. I've separately known her mother for maybe nearly 50 years. And I was friendly with her father and stepmother uh, for, well, coming, if, if not 50 years, coming on for it. And I knew her sisters, uh, I know her stepsisters, 
Yeah, I knew her. She was very nice. I liked Julia. Oh, I'll tell you an in interesting little incident that took place. We were having lunch uh, at Marco Pierre White's restaurant on St. James's. Uh, she used to, before she married Hans, she used to work at Christie's. She was a director at Christie's. And we were having lunch and Marco Pierre White was there and was lunching with someone else. And he sent over to tell the waiter to tell us that we were <laughs> such lovely looking girls that we were not going to be with them. That, how did he put it exactly? That, they were going to waive our bill or some such thing. <laughs> she was very pretty and she was very charming. And she became, once she married Hans Rousing, she became a huge, huge, huge philanthropist. She had had melanoma for must be about 20 years. And she fought it very valiantly. I mean, it must be 20 years that she had it. And she did everything in her power to defeat it. And I mean, to last for 20 years with melanoma shows determination and skill. Well, I was very sorry to hear that she died. Uh, I won't say how I heard, but I heard privately. And, uh, I mean, we'd all known that she had, that, she, you know, that she had been fighting melanoma for many, many years. But she didn't make a fuss about it. She didn't want anybody alluding to it. Uh, it was like a non-subject as far as she was concerned, which was good because she just got on with life. And I understand that, you know, it was a bit of a surprise that she sort of died when she did, but she was a good egg. Let's put it that way. She was a good egg. And... More than that, I will not say at this juncture. MP23 says, Lady C, as someone who is proudly of Jewish descent, what do you make of the police obstructing a Jew from crossing the road during a Palestinian process, protest, then apologizing to him? Yes, well, uh, I think everybody needs to understand that there should be a huge distinction made between people who are Jewish and people who are supporters of the state of Israel because many Israelis while they support the integrity of their state, they do not agree with everything that is happening in Israel, especially at the moment. Well, the person of whom you are speaking is someone called Gideon Falter, and he is, I think he's a head of the campaign against anti-Semitism. He evidently was at Aldwych and wanted to cross the road and he had on a yarmulke, I, if I remember correctly, uh, which is a distinguishing feature of Jews. And he doesn't wear it always. And, but he had it on. I think he was coming from the synagogue and he was on his way home, I suppose. I mean, anyway, he said that he was 
walking down a route that he often takes. And the officer tried to prevent him from crossing the road and was heard saying to him, you are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. Well, the fact that he's openly Jewish shouldn't deprive him of the right to cross the road. Equally, if he is sensible, you do not, for instance, if you went during the troubles in Ireland, if you were an orange man, you didn't go marching down a Catholic street and not expect to provoke a situation. I don't see why he couldn't have taken off his yarmulke, quite frankly. I would have taken off a, a distinguishing feature because I would have just been doing it to be less inflammatory, which doesn't mean that he had to take it off and he chose not to take it off. And I support his right to keep it on. But I also think the police should not have tried to, uh, to threaten to arrest him if he had crossed the street and there had been a problem, they would have been then obliged to rescue him. And I suppose they didn't want to. I think the whole thing's layered. I think that he's, all Jews should have a right to wear a yarmulke and even to protest in a a group within the Palestinian cause, because there are many Jews who, including all Hasidic Jews of any consequence, who support, who take a pro-Palestinian stance. So I think maybe the policeman was being a little bit overcautious. He might have thought he was being sensible. Uh, and proactive, and maybe he was being too proactive. I mean, it's very layered. Uh, and I think that people ought to realize, especially pro-Palestinian marchers, that many Jews support the cause of a free Palestine. So they shouldn't have anything against any Jew. It's nothing to do with somebody who is Jewish. It is to do with the politics that are presently operative in the Middle East, especially where Netanyahu is concerned. So I hope that answers the question. It's very layered. And as I say, there are many Jews who are pro-Palestinian. And there are many Jews who are anti what the state of Israel at present is embarked upon. Just as how there are many Palestinians who are not pro-Hamas. These are all distinctions that need to be made. Being in favor of a resolution of the Palestinian question does not mean that you are pro-Hamas. Just as how being Pro-Palestinian doesn't mean you are anti-Jewish. There are many Palestinian Jews. Golda Meir was one of them. 
She always said when she was asked what she was, she said she was Palestinian. I make that point for what it's worth. She always pointed out that she was a born Palestinian. Dave Murphy says, Hi Lady C, it's not just black countries where there is rivalry when someone is half caste or quarter caste, where the fairer person looks down on the darker person with detestation. Have you ever been to Vietnam? No, I haven't. I was so surprised to learn that ladies there try and be as fair skinned as possible. Many of them cover themselves from top to bottom when outdoors with coats, hats, long pants and gloves, despite the incendiary heat. In Vietnamese culture, the fairer the person, the more suitable they are for marriage. They are seen to be of a higher class. The dark skinned ones are looked down on as peasants, as they are the ones who people think slave away on the rice fields or fishermen, etc. I had no idea that sort of society judgment existed in countries that aren't black countries. Was wondering if you had heard of this happening in this day and age. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. I hadn't particularly heard of Vietnam, but it doesn't surprise me. I have a friend who is a princess, born as well as married, whose grandmother, who was a queen, said to her that she didn't think she was ever going to be able to make a good marriage because she wasn't fair enough, because she was brown-eyed, brown-haired, and olive-skinned, very pretty, while the more desirable look was to be fair-skinned, fair-haired, and either green or blue eyes. She ended up marrying very well. <laughs> mm. To a really great guy. <laughs> so these are prejudices that the Vietnamese have. I think what you are indicating is that it's elitist, it's class driven, and that color and class coincide in much the same way that the term blue blooded comes from Spain, where the Spanish aristocracy who kept out of the sun, their veins showed and they were a blue, while the ordinary Spaniards who worked got tanned and therefore their veins didn't show up as blue, hence the expression blue-blooded. What can I say? That will possibly ultimately change because nowadays we view, for instance, Lupita Iongo, the gorgeous looking actress. I mean, she's very dark skinned, but she's very beautiful. So I think now that status and color don't coincide the way they used to, because people don't have to work in fields anymore, you will see a sea change not only taking place, but continue to take place to such an extent that now many fair skinned girls go and get fake tans. And certainly in my generation, we all 
avidly tanned. I mean, I remember coming from school in New York and the following morning being up at the pool at 8.30 in the morning, slathered in olive oil, and then sometimes getting so burnt, <laughs> I was in bed for two or three days. Mm. Well, in my bedroom, because I couldn't even wear clothes, because it was unbearable to have clothes touch your skin anyway. So I think it's... It, the whole matter is changing, but I'm not sure. I, I think I think the coincidence of class and color is something that has been diverging in our lifetime, which is a significant change. Let's put it that way. Fiona Howard says, "I would buy High Grove products." before considering anything Megan was selling. All money raised by the Highgrove Estates goes to charity. Any money from Megan's products goes straight into her pocket. Well, the irony of it all is that Highgrove's strawberry jam has sold out. People are interested in buying high growth stuff because A, it's an association with the monarch or, and previously with the Prince of Wales. And it's an association with a worthy man and a worthy cause. While Meghan's association is with a D-list hustler surrounded by H-list wannabes. So you're not the only one. A lot of traffic has been driven by Megan's American Riviera Archard to High Grove. Interesting how these things work. And I don't think Megan understands that the reason why people support high growth products is not only because they're good, because they're rarely overpriced for what they are, but because they, people know they are supporting a good cause and there is some gold dust that emanates from having a high growth product. Where is the kudos from having a Meganian product? I don't think it exists. And I am going to end with my observation that because this is something that people have been commenting on, the snobbishness, the entitlement the rank and odious elitism of Katie Couric and Harry and Meghan. And they don't understand that they are not arbiters who will control and dispense and endow the citizenry with rights which they already possess and that these elitists are trying to snatch away from them under the guise of protecting them. Civil liberties are not a gift that the elite endow the citizenry with. They are rights that have been hard fought for over at least a millennium. You know, the, the struggle started long before Magna Carta in 1215. So we're looking at a thousand years, at least, of struggle, most likely longer. For the average 
person's rights, for all people's rights, I should say more than the average person, for the rights of all citizens of a country to exist and to be protected by the authorities. Not for elitists like the delusional Katie Couric and the delusional Meghan Markle and the delusional and brain dead Harry to then decide they're going to tinker with and endow the citizenry with those aspects of their already established rights that they wish to endow them with while they snatch away the rest of the rights. You know, the ordinary people have their rights. These are not gifts from elitists. And Katie Couric, Harry and Meghan make it absolutely clear that they are trying to find ways of stripping away the rights of those beneath them under the guise of protecting them from potential horrors or potential wrongdoers or potential harm. So, in other words, to make sure that you survive, they better kill you. <laughs> Figuratively speaking, of course. Kill your rights. Kill them out. And then dole those out that they regard as desirable. This is deeply disturbing thinking. And these are deeply dangerous people. And the only way to counter it is to develop an awareness of the danger and be vociferous in demanding that they be shut down because they are trying to shut all of you down. That's what they're trying to do. They are saying they know better than you that it is in your interest to lose rights that you have and that they should then be able to seize from you because they know better than you. Do you see the madness, the illogic and the total arrogance of it all? And on that note, I'd say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please keep the questions and comments coming in so I will know what you would like us to be addressing. Okay, thank you so much. Godspeed. And if you have truly enjoyed this, would you care to like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and take good care.